Welcome to Causing the Effect, a podcast focused on the exploration of your mind, body, and spirit. Scott Eilers, one of my favorite psychologists on the planet. What's going on, dude? Not a whole lot. What's going on with you, Scott? We're living, man. Me and Scott were talking before. Um, he's, dude, you're on top. You are like, you are focused. You are Mr. Prioritized. Just, uh, is this what this book is about? Now, your second book's coming out when? And give me like the, the rundown mm. on everything. So here's the thing. As an independent author, I assume I will be an independent author the second time. If, say, if some publishing company comes in and snatches me up, that's cool. But I'm not necessarily going to seek it out, right? I don't have an exact release date. I'm going to try to not be a total perfectionist about it. That is something that I struggle with. Mm -hmm. um, I would say, broadly speaking, spring 2023 feels pretty reasonable to me. Um, the purpose of the second book, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how it's going to be different from the first one, because the first book for when everything was burning was essentially meant to be like a summary of how I do therapy with people because there's a lot more people that wanted to see me for therapy than I could see for therapy. And I thought, how can I, how can I scale that? How can I reach more people and help more people without, you know, doing a hundred hour weeks? And I'm like, well, eventually I figured out I should write a book. So my first book was essentially a summary of my approach to therapy. And the second book is going to be kind of like what you said. It's more like my personal philosophies for life, the way that I live. So it's a little bit less, you know, here are some scientifically validated techniques for depression and anxiety and more like here are some things I do that maybe haven't really been studied yet or aren't formally considered uh, treatment interventions some of the things some of those things are the most fundamental parts of what I do and they can't really be categorized as like you know this isn't a cognitive behavioral therapy intervention this isn't a mindfulness intervention they're just things I've kind of picked up along the way and I want to get that information out there to people too. And yeah, I would say for the most part, it kind of explains how I do what I do. Cause I, I most certainly have not always been this guy, not even close. Now, I guess I feel like this comes down to being aware of a, what you want, what your values are, what your principles are and how you want to focus mm -hmm. your life. And I think that's always the most important step. How did you guide yourself through that personally? And how do you, you know, on the flip side of a God, your clients. And, and I feel like that's the hardest part, right? Is figure, figuring this stuff out. A lot of trial and error, to be frank. Um, like something I talk about in the introduction is I, um, I definitely had a lot of struggles early in life, especially adolescence was probably my rock bottom. And right around like senior year of high school, start of college is when I, I wouldn't say I had figured things out, not even close, but my trajectory was starting to go up after several years of just straight down, right? And it was mostly just because of things I had stumbled upon. Just like I'd have a certain thought and, and that thought would guide me to some action and, and my life started to get a little bit more in order. And that was all just stuff I was just kind of randomly finding my way into. So as many mental health professionals, I got into mental health partially to try to figure out my own mental health. That's like 95% of us, by the way, spoiler yeah, alert. Yeah, it's, no. it's, it, it, it's either it, any mental health professional either has struggled with their own mental health or has had someone very close to them struggle with their mental health other than like a few outliers. It, it's typically not something people get into without like a personal stake in the game, so to speak. Um, but I remember thinking like, if I figured this much out on my own, just me, some, you know, random ass 19, 20 year old, imagine how much more I'm going to know once I've like got a graduate degree and learn from all these mentors and take all these classes. And I found out that it didn't add as much as I thought it was going to. <laughs> and a lot of the things that I had kind of found on my own, at least for me on my own journey, had ended up being more fundamental to the turnaround I was able to experience than the more standardized mainstream stuff. And so that's really what I'm hoping to capture in this book is the stuff that you can't necessarily categorize as easily. Um, things that I didn't necessarily learn, you know, from school or from my mentors, but things I've just figured out through my own struggles, really. Yeah, I think that's, you, that, you know, that's why people, you know, kind of feel that personal connection to it. Uh, you've been, I've been through that. I know what you're going through. And I think that's why, every, and even making it more digestible, not to the people who are not, you know, noticeable with psychology. And you said something interesting there that you kind of realize your thoughts got, you know, you would catch yourself. And what I'm realizing about 
the layer underneath your thoughts is the beliefs that you have, or even or, or the layer underneath that. How much mm -hmm. do, does the belief system play, especially when you're growing up, and even the ones that you kind of don't even realize, like mm -hmm. marriage, any of the society stuff? How much does that play um, a role into that? And is that am I touching something that's going to be in the book at all? Absolutely, belief systems. I believe play more of a role in people's not only their thought processes but their lives in general mm -hmm. than we can even begin to understand so think of it this way you actually make probably hundreds of thousands of decisions every day if you really break it down to fine detail like every word you say tone of voice posture every physical action you take if you added all that stuff up it's probably millions it's at least hundreds of thousands right tiny little decisions we make every day very few of those decisions are made consciously we're meant to be able to work quickly like if you had to think if you had to engage your critical thinking ability to choose every word in a sentence this podcast we would say like 20 words each <laughs> it would be painfully slow and boring because we'd be painstakingly picking each word right so so most of the decisions that we make in a day are made at a subconscious level they don't reach that frontal lobe level of consciousness we're like oh let me think about that and figure out what i should do and beliefs are what guide the majority of your subconscious decisions which are going to be the vast majority of the decisions you make because there's just too many to think about. So for example, if you believe that you are, I should back up just a second, because it it's kind of difficult to differentiate beliefs and values, right? Um, I guess you could say beliefs are what you think you are, values are who you want to be, but, but they're definitely kind of in that same realm, right? Sure, sure. So if I value my physical health and I believe that I'm a person who is healthy or who wants to be healthy or something along those lines, right? So many of the little decisions I make in a day are going to be based on that belief. Everything down to like, like the food we eat is a good example. You don't consciously choose every single food that you eat. Eating is a, often a subconscious process, or at least the quantity of food is. You're not with every single bite, you're not pausing unless you're like, practicing some kind of extreme mindful eating technique or something, you don't pause before every single bite and say, okay, mm. what's my satiety level? How much of this should I eat? How am I going to feel after? You just kind of do it. A lot of times you do it while you're talking or watching TV or reading or whatever. So who you think you are is going to be the main factor that guides you to making all those subconscious decisions, which are probably going to be 99% of the decisions you make in your day and therefore your life in general. Those beliefs, though, if you never think about them, they'll never change, but they are not set in stone. They are not things that we have to just accept and live our lives by forever. So if you have belief systems that aren't serving you well, which I think we all do, I sure as hell did and still do to some degree, we got to reexamine those and recalibrate them because they're guiding us to choices and actions that aren't bringing us joy or happiness or satisfaction or whatever it is that you're trying to get out of life. How does somebody draw that dotted line from being the person they think they are to the person that they want to be? And I guess even in that process, right, the person you think you are, that's an interesting thought, right? Because I, I've the one thing I've learned by doing the podcast and just by being out there more, it's like I'm not who I thought I was. I thought I was this <laughs> ugly, jerky guy. And I'm like, oh, I'm the cool guy, like doing comedy. I'm like, I'm the cool guy now. When did this happen? Like, a, how do you become aware of who you really are? And then how do you connect those dots mm -hmm. to start changing those beliefs to really start aligning with your values? Mm -hmm. So anything that you have been, in, any idea that you've been exposed to somewhat frequently, and especially if it started early in life, your brain considers it knowledge. It considers it factual. Mm. And once your brain considers something factual, it doesn't engage critical thinking anymore. And that is by design, right? Because again, going back to that, to the language metaphor, once you have learned the word for something, you don't have to think about it every single time. If you did, conversations would take forever. Reading, writing would take forever. You wouldn't be able to get anywhere. So at some point your brain says, okay, I believe that this is this thing and I don't ask questions about it anymore. 
And for the most part, that helps us, right? That's how, because our language has however many words, I don't know how many, but it has a lot of them, right? <laughs> and you gotta learn them all pretty quick to be a functional human. So we're made to learn in that way. The problem is we can learn things that are subjective, right? That don't have an actual right or wrong. So if you learn that you're ugly, for example, if that's just a belief that you know enters your mind early in life, that becomes your truth. It's subjective, it, it's completely subjective, but if you've heard it often enough or thought it often enough or had enough experiences that reinforce that idea, at some point your brain just considers it a factual piece of information and you never second guess it, at least not on purpose, not automatically, and you live your whole life from this worldview, from this perspective that is completely subjective and possibly even wrong, right? So that's how the belief systems get formed. Now, your, your main question was like, how do you change them? You have to first realize that you have them or realize what they are because they don't feel like beliefs. We're using that term because that is the correct term, but they don't feel like beliefs. They feel like facts. They feel like knowledge. They feel like truths that you have just accepted about yourself and your life. Mine was more about my intellect. I didn't think I was very smart because I didn't perform real well academically, particularly in middle school or high school. So I've had like hardcore imposter syndrome my whole professional journey, right? Because mm. I felt like I had a lot of evidence that really showed like, I I'm not actually all that bright. Like my high school GPA was like, like a 2.7, a 2.8. It was not stellar, right? And so every step of the way, like in college and professionally for me, I've got this belief that like, Everyone here is probably way smarter than me. So I'm gonna have to work way harder, be way more on point, be way more organized to even be on their level. In order to, at some point, challenge that, I had to first realize that's a belief I'm living with. That's not an inarguable truth. It feels like it to me. It feels like I have this mountain of evidence that, can, that, that proves it. Like, but you have to kind of look back and realize you have gathered evidence from the perspective you already had. In other words, you've had a bias your entire life mm. and you've only been looking for evidence that supports your bias because you think that's how the world works. It's the same as how people are with politics or religion, or here's one I know you'll get where you live, sports fandom. Don't get like, me started, Scott. If I got, if I got to hear another New York team, I'm going to lose, <laughs> I'm going to lose it over here. I'm going to lose it. In sports fandom, you know, like hardcore fans, like they they will swear that their team is the good guys and the other teams, are, and, and they straight up hate. It's not even like, oh, I hope my team wins. It's like, you are my mortal enemy and I hate you because you're wearing this shirt. And if all, here, here's the funny thing. I, I think I read this in a book. I don't think I made this up, but like, <laughs> so let's say, let's say you got a Yankees fan and a Red Sox fan, right? If If in some weird alternate universe thing, all the coaches and players from each team got swapped. Just You just traded everyone. The entire teams were traded. The fandom would stay the same. They're not going to be like, oh, all the people I love are on, are on the Red Sox now. I am now a Red Sox fan. They're going to stick with the Yankees, even though it's all the people they were booing last year mm -hmm. and said they were the scum of the earth because it's their team, because that's their belief system. So you have to reframe what you think you know as a theory because you won't be able to look at it any differently. You won't be able to collect any evidence that even potentially contradicts it. If you are 100%, this is fact, this is reality, and I believe it. If you think that you're ugly, you have to reframe that in your head. I have a theory, a theory. that I am ugly, and I am going to attempt to look at all of the data that I collect today that relates to my attractiveness level, not only the data that supports what I already think is true. Because every person who believes something about themselves has had experiences that contradict that belief. Everybody who thinks they're dumb has done well on things, has gotten good grades on something, has, has done well at some task, right? Everyone who thinks they're ugly has been attractive to somebody. It's, there have been experiences that contradict your beliefs. But if you don't realize that you even believe that about yourself, you are not open to even looking at that stuff. Your brain just discards it as irrelevant and unimportant 
and you continue to believe the belief you already had. Mm. So I know that was a really long answer to your question, no. but to summarize, the short version is reframe the belief as a theory and then try to look at all the evidence, not so much in the past, because you can't go back. You've already seen those through a certain lens, right? But going forward, like starting today, what do the experiences you have in your day today tell you about this theory that you have about yourself? Does the majority of what you see support this belief? Or is there quite a bit of evidence that actually contradicts it and suggests maybe this isn't as true as I thought? That was beautiful, Scott. Yeah, and I think the um, that that just switching the word because there's something about belief. It's like, oh, it's true. But when you say because mm -hmm. I, I, you have to believe belief, it's it's almost like that. When you said theory, it's like, oh, okay, this is like an experiment. Even assumption came to my mind. Like, oh, am I assuming this? So part of it's becoming aware, becoming conscious of this thought. And I would say, is it safe to say, Scott? Everybody's basically gonna have some belief that's gonna of an emotional thing that's going to. Up, impact them in a negative way. I think it's just more how we're wired, right? That, that stuff, I don't want to worry too much about the trauma and the past. That's there. We all have that. And now becoming aware. And I guess, would you say just even being almost domesticated as a person, going to school when you're in this thing, are you good? Like for you, it was, it was for Scott, this Scott, that Scott, it was intellect for me, it was being ugly. So it's the, you know, and the same thing, it's, it's, it's always sort of there, but you have to, Keep eval I guess this is like a never-ending cycle of evaluation and eventually, because I'm assuming we have thousands and thousands of experiences of, of thoughts of thinking this same thing. It's not going to take a week to change this stuff. No, it's going to take a while. Yeah. Um, and yeah, you're absolutely right. Every single person has, you, you can't function without belief systems. You have to have belief systems. Uh, and not all of them are bad too. Like there's probably some positive belief systems everyone holds about themselves too. Um, it is kind of a fine line because you don't want to like completely deconstruct yourself and be like, Oh, I, I know absolutely nothing about who I am. I'm completely clueless about everything. And I got to re-examine my whole life, my whole exit. Like you don't want to get overwhelmed with it. Take it one thing at a time. Um, yeah. It's our, it's really is our experiences that, that, that build it up. I think um, something else I want to tie in with that too. I'm, I'm kind of bringing this all together with like where we got started on you know, productivity and, 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 how to organize your day and stuff like that. The main premise of uh, this book that I'm working on right now is that there are these four areas in life where uh, you call it kind of domestication, right? But sort of the standardized parts of life that we all more or less have to experience. Dealing with other people, going to school, going to work. Um, there's a lot of sameness in our lives, right? There's certain, certain situations we kind of all deal with to some extent. And I think that those situations tend to pull us in these certain directions mm -hmm. that are really mentally unhealthy for us. It's kind of like, you know, your physical health as you age and just put wear and tear on your body. If you don't do anything to maintain your physical health, at some point it starts to get worse, right? And you have to develop certain regimens to like keep your physical health in check or it will start to decline. I very, very strongly believe that the same is also true of our mental health, that you reach a point where kind of just the stressors and the grind of life will start to wear you down. If you don't have habits or routines or strategies or philosophies in place to kind of counteract the burden the world places on you, which frankly, I feel is a lot, at least here in the U.S. Um, so the four areas that I feel like the world really pulls us towards are to be distracted, kind of accidental about like how we organize our day, very externally focused and very rigid. And I think all four of those traits are really detrimental to our mental health. So what this book is going to be all about is how to, if, if you picture a continuum or four continuums, I should say for each of those things, how to stay on the other end of the continuum, how to stay intentional about living your life and allocating your time and doing things, you know, making a plan, making goals that actually mean something to you and not just falling into other people's expectations or just a, a generic routine, being attentive and being able to choose what to pay attention to because the world is constantly trying to grab your attention, right? Do this, look over here, listen to this. It, it's, it's, there's the clickbait and the media and social media and everything else, advertising, all trying to grab us and pull our attention in some certain direction. Being able to pull that back 
and say, no, nope, no friend, that's mine. That attention belongs to me and I get to put it where I want it, where I think it's gonna serve my life most. I think it's something we need to be able to do. Um, being too externally focused, you get into like maladaptive social comparisons or feeling like you need certain milestones or achievements to feel good about yourself. It's never ending, it's a slippery slope. And being able to put that appraisal of like, who am I, how am I doing, am I on track? Being able to put that more inside of yourself and looking at internal factors for happiness, internal factors for success, not necessarily those benchmarks that other people use because they ultimately end up being uh, pretty worthless and insignificant for a person's overall happiness. And then the hardest one for me by a mile is trying to be flexible, trying to not get too locked in to like, this is what I have to do. This is the way I have to live. Because no matter what kind of plan you have for life, no matter how much you know, no matter how well thought out your, your day or your week or your month is, there's always going to be something you didn't see coming, like getting jumped, for example. I'm guessing you did not have a plan for that. <laughs> Probably wasn't something you were anticipating to have to work into your week, right? And I'm sure that for a while, at least to some degree, your life changed after that event, as it should, as it had to. If you just instantly tried to live your life like nothing had ever happened, I don't think that would have gone real well for you. I tried. You took that as like, yeah. It didn't work. (laughs) It didn't work. (laughs) It never does. I, yeah. So, so you got to have this really good plan. Then you also got to realize the plan's not always going to work and you're going to have to change it. That flexibility piece is that fourth criteria. And that is by a mile, the hardest one for me. And, and how much do you think, because I, when, when I hear, for me, when I get more rigid, I feel like I can get more focused and more scheduled, but there's almost, I, I lack um, mm-hmm. a playfulness about life. You almost stop treating mm-hmm. life that way. And I think that, I think like, we got to put this in the beginning of, of education, Scott, because I think you hit everything on the head because the attentiveness is just the focus of, of this generation debilitates me of just, you know, even myself, it's hard. You have social media, you have yeah. all these different things. And then on, on overlaying all of this and tell me, I, th- I know you agree with this is this image of perfection that we all have to have. And, and for me, that perfection, it's impossible to attain. And that just leads back to this self-rejection, which comes into the thoughts. And it's this cycle that I don't, I don't, I, I think it's a perfect time for you to be writing about this stuff because this is that internal piece is where people find their values and where you really start figuring out. Cause like for, I, I don't want, kids to go through what I went through and, and you take all the boxes of what society tells you, you do and you go, Oh, this isn't even what I want. That's the, de- that's debilitating in itself too. Mm-hmm. That that's what motivated me to write this entire book. Basically like that last sentence that you just said, because the last two years of my life, objectively speaking have been incredible. I've, I've started these two intensive outpatient programs. I published a book. I'm working on a second book. We move to a, admittedly a fixer upper house, but like, it's going to be our dream house. Once it's all done, it might take a few years, but it's still this big, like there's all these big, exciting things happening in my life. Right. And I guess I had this expectation of what, first of all, I didn't ever think I was going to get to this phase of life. Like I, I, I didn't think this was ever going to happen, but if it did happen, I had kind of this idea of what it might feel like to get there. I had, to, I had a professional mentor um, when I was in grad school and an intern named Kim. And sometimes I would just like, I'd run programs with her and, and she was my supervisor and stuff. Sometimes I would just look at her and I'd be like, how good must that feel to be you? Like you must just, you must just wake up every day and just be like, yep, I've done it. Like I'm living my best life. This is it. All I got to do is just keep doing what I'm doing and I'm good. And I never thought I would be at a Kim level, but I always thought that's what it would feel like if I was, right? Well, I, I more or less am at that level, you know, professionally anyway, and, and like, you know, family's good, family's healthy. And there are moments where it feels the way that I thought it was going to, but it hasn't been as consistent as I thought it might. And so I've gotten to the point where like, I've had to realize, okay, it's not because my life isn't good enough. I, for a long time, I could say, well, like a lot of things in my life kind of suck. So of course I don't feel great. Right. But that's not true anymore. I I really have been able to deal with a lot of the objective external problems I was facing. 
And I still have those moments. I still have those days or sometimes even those weeks where it's just like, I am just not feeling this right now. And so that's what's made me kind of take a, take a step back and, and look at the big picture. Like, well, what, why is this happening? What am I doing that is preventing me from fully appreciating and fully engaging with my life? Or what am I not doing? I think sometimes it can be either one. And that's what, that's what inspired my idea of like these four continuums, because I notice it's when I drift more to this other side, when I'm, when I'm getting distracted by a lot of things, when I'm focusing on really external factors, um, and when I'm being really rigid with myself about my expectations, that's when I get into those funks where I'm like, yeah, I've got all this, these achievements and this stuff, and it just doesn't feel like it matters today. And when I can pull all those things back to the other side, then things kind of click again and it starts to feel like, okay, I feel my life again. You know what I mean? Um, you asked like specifically about that flexibility too. The, the picture, I, I think in metaphors and pictures a lot, and what keeps coming to mind for me, and this is something I'm going to incorporate into the book too, is the first time I grew up fishing a lot, mostly on like a small like a, a 1200 acre lake that's not small but it's like it's not huge and I remember taking this fishing trip with my dad on Lake Vermilion which is about 80,000 acres I mean it's a it's a big lake and it's very open we went fishing on this really windy day and I had never been on a boat on a big lake on a windy day before and I didn't really know what you, what you were supposed to do and I kind of just stood and fished like I normally would. And I, within five minutes, I'd about fallen overboard three times. I'm like, okay, this is not working. And I eventually figured out like, you can't lock your legs when the boat's moving that much because you, you might think you found, okay, I got to angle my body this way or stand like this. Those thousands of waves you see when you look out on the lake or the ocean or whatever, they're all a little bit different from one another, just a little but they're all just different enough that what worked for one doesn't necessarily work for the next one. And if you try to just stand some certain way and think that's gonna let you withstand every single wave that hits the boat, you will lose your balance. And the only way that you can handle all these different sizes and shapes and types of waves is if you have some looseness in your body, right? Some flexibility, like the suspension on a vehicle so that your body can just move and respond in relation to the water and not try to predict what's going to happen and already be ready for it. Mm -hmm. And I just think that that is life. Like you, you cannot predict every single thing that's going to happen to you in even a single day, let alone a week, a month, your entire life. And if you cannot predict everything that's going to happen to you, you cannot possibly develop a plan for life that is going to prepare you for every single thing that you're going to experience because you will at some point hit something that you were not ready for. And if you don't know how to be flexible with what you think is the right way to handle problems or to handle conflict or to handle whatever it is life is thrown at you, you will fall overboard on that day when you get hit by that wave you weren't ready for. Flexibility is the only way you get through it. No, it sounds like you figured out your, your own little issue there, Scott. That's pretty good. Now, now it's because I'm working I, on it. <laughs> yeah. Because I'm realizing that that scare, being scared of the impermanence and just that's the way life is. You have to accept it and, and looking at it almost from a place of love instead of fear um, changed that for me. Because I'm starting to realize like everything sort of falls into fear, anger, all that stuff. That's one side. And then this other side, is the side you were saying, the love and, and being appreciative and, and just like understanding that this is the way it is like this. Listen, it's going to happen regardless. Why would you, you know, stiff your way through the dance when you could, you know, kind of flow your way through it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. How much do you, do you think those feelings of love and fear come into people's belief systems? Like, cause I feel like everything deep down comes down to those certain situations of, you know, how much you were loved mm -hmm. or all that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, how does somebody work their way to understanding that piece? Well, I think you're absolutely right. And I, I hope this doesn't sound overly cynical, but uh, in, at least in my line of work, it's belief systems probably are more fear-based than love-based. I agree. We're right. mammals. So that isn't necessarily a bad thing. Like we are survival oriented creatures, right? There are parts of our brains that exist for no other purpose than to try to keep us alive. So it's important to remember that your brain is an organ. 
And the number one job of any organ in the mammalian body is to help you not die. That, that's priority number one. That takes precedence over anything else, right? So it's, e it's easy for us to get frustrated with our brains or our thoughts because they don't always make us happy. Well, that, that's honestly not their job. Your, your brain is just another thing that's meant to keep you living. Figuring out how to be happy is a whole other thing and it is not automatic. So our brains as organs, they prioritize fear. Fear is if, if, if you got, well, at any moment in your life, there'll be more demanding your attention than you have attention to give. Even if there's not a lot going on, even just like the sensory processing of everything around you, you cannot consciously attend to all of it at once. And so your brain has to make some decisions about like, what is the most important thing happening right now? What do I need of all this craziness going on around me? What subsection of it do I need to essentially like kick up to, to the higher ups, which is the frontal lobes, the conscious thinking mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for like further analysis and fear will almost always be if there's anything scary present in your environment, that's almost always what will get prioritized because fear equals threat and threat equals I might, be, even if it's not a literal life or death threat, our brains aren't real good at define or, or, or making that discrepancy, especially given how much our society has changed recently. Like a good example is social rejection. Social rejection in this day and age isn't fatal. It, it sucks. Like it's, it's a miserable feeling, right? But you're not going to literally die because people don't like you. That's actually a pretty new thing though, if you really think about it. Right. Like it was not that long ago that humans were a tribal species and, and you couldn't, you know, you couldn't grow your own food and hunt and build a shelter and be a night watchman. You couldn't do all those things at once. You had to have your tribe. You had to have your community for survival. And it was almost impossible for humans to survive alone. And social rejection would probably kill you in that day and age, right? Mm -hmm. the, the fact that we can, like, you can live completely independently if you want to as a human being now, that's pretty new. It really is. We don't have to worry about like, oh, if I, if I piss off the doctor, like no one's going to treat my wounds if I get hurt. Like, you know, you, you, you can go to a different doctor now, but you know, a few hundred years ago, you might have to walk 50 miles to find the next guy you can do that. And that's not feasible. So that's just one example, but our brains interpret a lot of things that are more like painful experiences or frustrations or inconveniences as being potentially life or death. And so we're constantly focused on the scary negative stuff. And that is what strengthens the formation of a lot of our belief systems is we'll have a really painful, a really unpleasant experience like social rejection. And we'll try to figure out like, well, what, what happened and how can I make sure it doesn't happen again? You know, if, if a, if a girl dumps you because she doesn't think you're good looking enough, you might, maybe the belief system that gets formed is like, okay, I, I, I overshot. I don't want to feel that way again. So maybe I didn't realize that this person was out of my league. Maybe I'm not as good looking as I think. I'm going to consider myself ugly now and make sure I kind of date within that realm so I don't get rejected for my looks again. When really that was a subjective thing, maybe a one-time thing, one person's specific preferences, whatever. But we build these belief systems, not on purpose, but we build them to try and stay out of these painful, scary situations that feel life or death because our brains are a little bit out of date with regards to the reality of our society. Yeah. I think um, we are a society of thinkers, right? We're trying to figure everything out and do it. It's, it's maybe we got to think a little less. And that's why I think that second step of being attentive, being mindful mm -hmm. is the key here. Because I, I think, think uh, listen, thinking is very useful. But if you spend your day just thinking, then you would be a classic overthinker. That's we mm -hmm. made an episode about that, overthinking social situations. Um, I, I think we have to understand that turning the brain off at some points and just washing the dishes, just wash the dishes. And when you start focusing on what you're doing, you're becoming more responsible. And then if you're responsible, you could alter the decisions that you're, you know, and then that means you're aware. And I think in, in all the religious texts, they're speaking of free will. And I think that is what free will really is, is being aware and kind of living. We're always gonna have to play the games that of the societies, but playing your own game within um, that's, 
the way that you kind of get through this life without getting tugged in all these different directions. Exactly. That's honestly, mm -hmm. ultimately, I think where you, where you kind of win or lose yeah. is the internal battle. It, it, it doesn't matter as much as most people think what's going on outside. What's going on inside is what determines your reality. And that's, what's going to make you feel some certain way about your life. Scott, I never, like, I always be, I've said that thousands of times in this podcast. I'm like, nah, I don't, I don't know. And then this year, just when there's a couple bad things coming, what am I, I I've been feeling and thinking anger. And what do you see? Anger. And then if you're feeling and seeing it, that means you're acting it some mm -hmm. way. And then what are you going to get back? Anger. And like, since I got punched in the face, I've been like, just giving love and all I see is love. And all I get is, I'm like, this is just, it's, it's mm -hmm. that simple people. It's it, this, this stuff is, it's, it's simple, but it's, it's not easy. And I think being the attentive part yeah. is the key to this and really being able to take that step towards awareness and say, where, what are my thoughts? Cause that's scary. The, the first time I started waking up, I consider myself, Scott, I'm like six years old now. Cause I woke up around 26, 27. I didn't know what I was doing. You know, you're just living off that. It's scary stuff, man. It definitely can be, but once you start to get a handle on it, it's incredibly powerful. Do you have a name for this book yet? Mm, I got like two or three tentative okay. titles. Save it, save I, it then. Not, yeah. With the first book, that was literally the last thing I figured out. And I actually, I don't think I'd even met you by then, but uh, I, I got so like indecisive about na uh, uh, title and cover. I ended up crowdsourcing it to my Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> I posted my, I had four ideas. I'm like, okay, I got it narrowed down to four. So I posted all four covers and titles and had people vote on which one they liked the most. And the cover that ended the, the cover I actually used with the title for when everything is burning got like 50% of the votes out of the four. So it was, it was the clear runaway winner. There's a chance I may end up doing that again. Cause I, mm. I struggle with making that final decision of like, okay, this is what it's going to be forever. It's sometimes I need help with that last little push. Yeah, it's still your choice, right? You're just getting the final push. Dude, that name for, for when everything is burning. I thought it was perfect because it still sticks in my, in my, um, in my brain, but dude, I Scott, thank you. Thank you, man. As always, just for dropping the knowledge and you know, everybody, everybody knows Scott, he's the cornerstone of my <laughs> cornerstone psychologist here, but I appreciate all the work and we'll link for when everything is burning below and we'll, we'll see you again, Scott. Thank you, my man. Sounds good. I appreciate it. I'll talk to you soon, Scott. Sounds good. Uh, Cause the effect community. Thank you guys so much. I don't know what's going on. Scott, I was telling Scott earlier, you guys are blowing up, blowing it up. Um, thank you so much for the support. It really um, means the world to me. Let's just keep doing what we're doing. Tell one friend about it. Um, you guys are clearly doing that. Thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. As always, stay safe, stay positive, stay blessed. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.